Good morning, good afternoon, good evening and good night. Welcome, welcome, welcome to the Author to Author podcast. I am your host, Pamela R. Haynes, award-winning author of two books called Loving the Brothers and Loving the Sisters. I interview independently published and traditionally published authors from around the globe. The Author to Author podcast is available on 20 plus streaming platforms and six radio stations, namely East London Radio Mixcloud, Pam Tango Radio, UK246.com, Chalk Hill Community Radio, LWR Talk Radio and the Sounds of My Life radio station. The podcast is sponsored by Dalgetty Herbal Teas. Use the discount code A2AS6 for 10% off your next Dog Getty Tea order. In this week's episode, I interviewed bookseller and publisher Garfield Robinson. We talked about his career at The Voice newspaper and his book, Keepers of the Flame, Saluting 100 Black Authors. Let's jump into his interview now. See you on the other side. Good evening, Garfield. How are you doing today? Very good, very good, Pamela. Um, how did you spend today? Oh, today I was in office. So office stuff, doing mail, telephone calls, chasing people, all kind of stuff. But good stuff. Okay, excellent. Well, we're going to get to your work in a minute. Tell us, where are you from in the world in terms of your heritage? Oh, and where are you based okay. now? All right. So I was born in, well, actually in Mandeville in Manchester in Jamaica, right? And uh, I grew up in St. Elizabeth, which is also in uh, Jamaica, and went to school there. And uh, I actually came to the UK. I think I was following in the steps of my grandfather and my father. And I came here at what, age 39 to seek my fortune like the rest of my family. Yeah. And in terms of being in the UK, where were you based? Okay, so right now I'm in Lewisham, South London. And uh, yeah, I'm a South Londoner because I've, I've lived in Peckham in South London as well. So yeah, I'm, I'm a South Londoner. So what do you remember of the, uh, about the UK when you arrived at 39 years old? Oh, yes. So at that time, we went, we came to Heathrow, right? And I remember coming out at Heathrow and uh, everywhere was different shades of grey, right? That's all I remember. And I said to myself, what is this I've got myself into? <laughs> and that was the 30th of September. That would have been 2001. The same, the end of the month of 9-11. That was the month I came to the UK. Oh, wow. Okay. Um, and you said you were based in South London. Uh, very yeah. different from um, growing up in, in Jamaica. But um, I take it you've had the opportunity to travel between um, London and Jamaica ever since? Yeah, yeah, man. I've been back a couple of times, uh, seen a lot of changes. Yeah, a lot of good changes. Uh yeah, some things haven't kept up, but uh, yeah, there's a lot of good changes in, in Jamaica. And describe for us what a perfect day in Jamaica looks like when you go on holiday. Oh, <laughs> I think you're looking into my diary because I'm, I'm going on holiday soon. So, so ideally, a perfect day is with family, you know, and uh, talking about the old times, the good old days. Yeah, and even, even as bad as these days are, when we talk about them in the future, these are going to be the good old days. That's that's what, you know, old people say. So, yeah, talking talking with relatives especially, yeah, and, and uh, yeah, having a meal, you know, maybe some maybe some jelly coconut water outside under the coconut tree and make sure no no he'll lick in your head. So, so, yeah, it's that, relaxing with family. That's my, that's what I love to do when I'm there. It's wonderful. What was your first job when you came to London? All right. So my first job, when my when I came to London, my first, first job was I registered with Office Angels, right? Because uh, I bought a loot, a loot newspaper, a free newspaper. And uh, I was looking for jobs and somebody said, buy a loot, man. So I bought a loot and I was looking for some jobs. And I called this place and the man said, uh, can you come here on Saturday? And I said, yes. <laughs> and uh, 
when I realized it was actually the loot office that, that it was, they, they have a division called loot hot car where the free ads for the cars, they give you a whole pile of stuff and you need to call them and get people to upgrade their adverts. So that was my baptism into selling on the phone because in Jamaica, a lot of things is face to face. Even though there's a lot more phones and emails and websites and all of that. But in, in those days, uh, most of the selling I did in Jamaica was face to face. So coming here and doing most things over the phone was it was a, an eye opener for me. I mean, that's fantastic. I, I suppose then that leads into other work that you have done since then. So tell my listeners, what was your career path into what you're doing now? When I was actually leaving Jamaica, I was actually working at the Glena head office, right? And I worked, I actually worked on uh, online advertising, right? So I didn't work at the newspaper bit. I was, you know, an introduction to online advertising. And so I, I would do deals over the phone, but there's still people I had to go and see. Even if you called up somebody and they like everything, what you say and everything, they still want to see you. It's not like here, you can do everything on the phone without going to see anyone. So, so I did that. So when I was coming here, you know, my boss there spoke to the manager here and said, uh, you know, Garfield's wife responded to an ad in from the Gleaner and, and she got a job in England. So the family's coming up. So, I mean, he's been selling here and, you know, online, but you might want to try him at the newspaper advertising. And that's what happened. So I reported at Elephant and Castle to George Ruddock and uh, he said, OK, so, you know, the boss in Jamaica said, you know, you're, you're worth a try. So, you know, so I said, well, how do I start? So I said, OK, two of the nearest places to Elephant and Castle right now where you'd find that this is the weekly gleaner UK. Right, so it was some voice said we could be in the UK. We'd find a lot of people is Brixton down the road. I think I jumped on a P5 bus from Elephant. I didn't know the other number buses, I'd learn them later. And then I was living in Peckham already, so you know, I would either be in Brixton in the day or Peckham, you know, walking and looking and looking for the Jamaica flag and talking to people. And that's how I started selling, you know, with the Gleaner in, in the UK. Right. And then eventually, no, I would put my what I learned at the loot uh, to come with what I, you know, the face to face selling. In, and, and so I started out. So so that was Gleaner. And that would have been 2001 to and then 2004. Now, the Gleaner came together with RJR in Jamaica and they bought the voice. So that's how the voice came into the picture. So. 2004, now I was selling for the Gleaner and the Voice, and then some people might remember that for a for a what am I saying for a hot minute there was a free black newspaper called London Extra, right? So for a hot minute I was selling on three newspapers, right? And I can still remember the first campaign I got, which went across all three papers, and that was the Brunswick Sardine advert which uh, Grace Foods is like the agent for Brunswick Sardine in the UK. So Grace has been my client from way, way back. So, so I, I called him up and we were chatting and said, oh, by the way, we have this campaign, blah, 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 blah. And send us a quotation. So the advert ran for eight weeks. So it was on the front of the voice. Each week would be a, it's four varieties. So we'd one, two, three, four, and then repeat. Same thing on the front of the London Extra and the same thing on the front of the Gleaner. So, yeah, I remember I remember that like it was yesterday. That was a nice campaign. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Wow. Wow. So you were selling across three um, papers. Right, yeah. um, what is it that you do now? Oh, I still do advertising. So the, the landscape is a little bit different now. There's a lot more online, more digital stuff. So at the moment... So I still sell on the Gleaner, right? Then, uh, depending on what the campaign is, someone might have a campaign and they want some Jamaican or Caribbean viewership. So I can sell that on the Gleaner website, which even though it's housed in Jamaica, well, the website is everywhere. So that, that can do that. It's really what the client wants. And then for Voice now, there's a Voice newspaper, which turned monthly in 2019. Right, so 2019 it turned monthly, but it had been weekly up to that time. 
So there's Voice Newspaper, the Voice website, there's Voice Facebook, there's Voice Twitter, Instagram, uh, LinkedIn, and YouTube. So depending on what the campaign is, it can go across like as many places as possible. Then uh, I've worked on many magazines too. Most people know The Voice for newspapers, but we have published a lot of magazines over time. Some of them are like one-off, but some of them are like series. So in 20, 2016, we had an A5 magazine called uh, The Voice Food and Restaurant Guide. So it was A5 I remember magazine. that. Yes, all of us worked on it. And then I remember going to Birmingham to the Birmingham, I think it was the Birmingham Food Festival. It was a big, I think, two-day event with maybe what? I think let's say over the two days, they get upwards of 5,000, maybe 10,000 people. I remember going on stage to launch the magazine in Birmingham. That was really special. <laughs> so, so, and I have to give thanks to my team. It was me alone, but I got the important bit to go on stage to talk about it but we all worked on it together and then we ran the food and restaurant guide until covid came when you know most of the restaurants were closed so the magazine was kind of a little bit redundant so but in that time now we had started another one which was called uh, this one was a4 which is the voice black business guide so that one will be food and all different sorts of businesses and that one now we started in 2018. And uh, we started, it was once a month, no, once a year, once a year. And then uh, 2021, coming out of COVID, we turned it uh, based on what the clients needed. We It went to twice a year. So we're still working on twice a year with the Voice Black Business Guide. Yes, and you have the latest copy there with you. <laughs> yeah, That's the current yes. issue. Yeah, I picked this up so. from you a few weeks ago at Tilbury. the event to celebrate um, the Windrush down oh, in yeah. Tilbury. Tilbury yeah, yeah. yeah, so I picked up a yeah. copy of that um, here as yeah. well. And I'm sure if I dig up on my desk somewhere, You'll I do have the restaurant there. guide. Yeah. I've got the restaurant guide as well because yeah. my friend is in it, you know, her vegan Caribbean food that she yeah. was promoting at the time. Yeah, it's, it's interesting when you say that uh, restaurants obviously took a hit during the pandemic. Yeah. They weren't, yeah. you know, they weren't open. So what is your role then? What do you do at the okay. you know, at the Voice? What's your title, that's, I suppose? That's interesting. All right. So my title, if I can remember it, is Senior Accounts Manager slash Special Projects, right? So the special projects bit now. So let's say let's say we are going to say a conference to where Birmingham or, or in London. I am tasked with ascertaining everything we need to be at the conference, right? So I'll check the storage and you know things we took back from previous events. If we need to order banners, I liaise with the printers, work with the designer. If we need to order flyers and that sort of thing. If we are low on stock or so I, I talk to you know the relevant people say to accounts i need this and if manager needs to sign it off or if it's you know something we do that then uh on the actual day of the event or the days of the event i'm normally i'm usually responsible for the team and the the presence there right so you know people do certain things you know rest time there's some events we go, you have one shift from early morning to that time and then another team will come. So I, I you know, take part in all of that. And then uh, whatever help I need from the managers, you know, I pull them in wherever I need them. So that's the special projects bit of it. But the rest of it is, is really advertising and, uh, you know, there's a couple accounts that are managed, you know, so long-standing clients i mean like i mean like grace foods i mean I've, I've worked with them for many 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 years you know in fact when we did the food and restaurant guide they were the main sponsor for the five years we did it so i sing i sing well it sounds like a really interesting job and you obviously enjoy what you're doing but yeah. beside your nine to five you yeah. also have another world that you moved into. I have to say, you were, were one of the first people to befriend me when I first published my very first book. I remember meeting you at, I think it was Wolverhampton. It was Wolverhampton yes. Central. 
within that complex. Yeah, Walthamstow yeah. Assembly Hall. That's where it was. Yes. You were you, you held the corner, lots of tables with um, yeah, yeah. displaying the books. How did you move into that side of um, right. publishing? <laughs> Do you have 15 minutes or you have 15 days? All right, I'm going to make it short. <laughs> so basically, what I, what I was trying to tell someone the other day that when I, when I lived in Jamaica, right, especially when I got my first job, I used to more or less live in bookshops, right? So I would go to a bookshop and I would browse until I find one or two books to, to buy and take home with me. So I was buying books like nobody's business. So I've left quite a bit of a library. I think my sister has actually used some of them at her little basic school. So this good, right? So when I came to the UK now, how I actually got into books is that uh, my wife came as a teacher and a couple of other teachers came, you know, from Jamaica and other parts of the Caribbean. One teacher in particular, she, you know, knew I worked at the Glean and so forth. And uh, she actually realized that she had come to this new country for the first time and she was learning the culture and heritage from the children, not from adults. She was learning the norms and whatever from the children. And she said, you know something? I think it's only right. Miss Lou would have said turn tanks. Louise Bennett. It's only right that I give them a bit of my heritage and culture in exchange, you know, just to they, they know about uh, that. And I think maybe also in her mind, she didn't say that, but maybe in her mind, uh, maybe some places, when you say the name Jamaica, some people not sure, and some people maybe have experienced the good side of Jamaica, so they'll know. But it's it's uh, maybe she was like playing the role of an ambassador for the children, maybe Later in life, they might be looking to go to holiday in Jamaica, but maybe that's me stretching it a bit, right? So I was able to find some, so she was asking my wife if I could find her things that, you know, reflect the cultural heritage. And I was able to find some, not CDs, I was able to find some audio cassettes of Louise Bennett, right? Because the Gleaner office was actually the outlet for the bookstore in the Gleaner group. I think it's... Don't quote me, maybe, oh God, maybe Kingston Bookshop. But anyway, the, the, the bookstore that's in the Gleaner group, the Elephant and Castle office was like the outlet. So they had shelves and everything with books there. But after a while, they had, you know, whittled it down and they, they had packed away what was left. That's how come I found Miss Lou's things in the storeroom. So I said to the lady at the reception, uh, I'd like to buy these, write me up an invoice, right? And I'm going to sell them and I'm going to pay for the invoice. I still have that first, that's the first invoice that started my business, right? And then as uh, as I go to school, I like to drop off my son in the morning. I, you know, chat to the parents. And I always say this, especially if they look Jamaican. And don't ask me what look Jamaican mean, but I can identify a Jamaican <laughs> when I see one. And you know, if you have one, the, the black, green, and gold, you know. But there's a, I think we have a look. And it's not even like they open them out yet, but we have a certain look. <laughs> so, so, and what I realized now is that people were actually interested. Uh, so they were grandmas, they had children born here who had maybe never been to Jamaica and they wanted to share a bit of the heritage and culture with them. So they were interested in, you know, getting a book here and there and so forth, the parents and so forth. And then... I was, you know, learning that there was this bit of a need, you know, and there was this, you know, curiosity and all of that. So it was in, it was in 2002 now, in about September thereabouts, I picked up a newspaper, might have been the same Gleaner in the, you know, the entertainment section. And I saw that they were having this event at 336 Brixton Road. And it was a cultural event for Black History Month. And I said, wow, that looked interesting. So I called them and we had a little chat. And then I booked a space. I don't remember if I paid him over the phone or whatever, but I booked a space there. And then I decided now to run around and get some little things that would reflect, you know, Jamaican heritage. Because I started out by calling the business Jamaica Heritage because I'm reflecting my, my cultural heritage. So I found some... Biz publications up in North London, Black Scientists and Inventors books. So I bought some of those books. And then uh, I found a brother out in East London, does T-shirts. And at about the same time, I'd also, I was able to speak to Miss Lou, Louise Bennett in Canada. And I said, you know, Miss Lou, I 
Don't ask me how my fire alarm number was. I think I got it from somebody who, yeah. I'm doing a little event and I've, you know, we decided to put your uh, your picture on the t-shirt and everything. And, you know, we're trying to get your blessing. And she said, yes, you can do it. But remember the old lady. So I've always, I've always uh, tried to be an ambassador for Louise Bennett because she has done a lot to Jamaica, especially making us know. I mean, she studied in England. She toured in England and she was making us know that Jamaican patois is not bad talking. Right, she said, English language as we know it is derived from Norman French and this and that and that and that and that, and it's a derived language. The same way Jamaican patois derived from English and tree and all them different African languages and maybe some other language you don't even know. So Jamaican is a derived language too, right? So the English language is not better than Jamaican Patois because they're on the same level being derived languages. And that's how we need to look at it because uh, people need to do what they need to do, but those who need know better do better, you know. And uh, the other bit now is that in, I forget which year this is now, but the Institute of Linguistics, which is based in the UK, has also designated Jamaican, they don't call it Jamaican Pato, Jamaican to be a language, right? So I know there's going to be a debate, maybe people on the, the thing on off screen, but you can check them sources. It's not me, Cesar. <laughs> so first of all, what you're saying is the business started out promoting Jamaican heritage. Yeah. yeah, and over the years now, it's expanded and the business is now called Promoting Our Heritage, yeah. which includes all the countries in Africa, the Caribbean, yes. and Black British writing as well. So authors yes. who are here. You're always so busy though, Garfield. How do you manage to fit all of the events in? I try not to be, you know. I try not to be, but... Uh... I do have a couple of friends who will represent me at events. So we are, we have a kind of ad hoc cooperation thing where depending on what happened, they'll have some of my books with their books. And then when I go out, I'll have some of their books with my books. So we're kind of doing that in an ad hoc way, but we're looking to formalize it. You know, in, in fact, today we were on the email, the three of us who kind of work together. And I realized that there's a couple of events that I won't be able to attend because of, you know, work commitments. So I've sent the link to them and said, look here, guys, you need to be at these events. And uh, we were sorting out who's going to wear and all that sort of thing. So, I mean, I, I do a lot and I'm busy, but I, me alone can't do everything. So I do try to direct, you know, people to where they need to go. And in fact, those two guys, you know, I call them my sons, because they're my book sons, right? <laughs> And one of them, to his credit, Mr. Simon Hudson, he had produced a calendar, would have been, would have produced a calendar in 2020. Yeah, 20, 2019, 2020, he produced a calendar, which is like looking at what happened in this day in Black history, you know, what happened on this day. And uh, he actually called up the voice, right? And he said... Uh, Look here, I've done a calendar and it's about black history and I don't know what to do next. <laughs> so I said, hello, sir, come and see me and we'll have a chat. So he came and saw me and we discussed like how we could advertise with the voice and, you know, there's different promotional things we could do. And I said, but by the way, I'm going to be at, uh, I'm going to be at a venue like this coming Saturday. If you're not free, come with your calendars and put out a couple of them and see what happens. So that's what we did. And then he went to a couple more events with me. And then he said, you know, Garfield, I like this thing. I like this, <laughs> right? So next thing I know, it's COVID and it's lockdown. And we, not back one and two emails, but we're not really active out there. But there's nowhere to go. Next thing when COVID is freeing up now, I get a message from him. Hey, in lockdown, I produced a two-part book. So it's a book like this. And it's like the feedback he got from the calendars. People said, look here, love the calendar. And all of that. But I want to know the stories behind the listings on the calendar. And that's how he produced his volume one and volume two book. And uh, I'm happy to say that at the moment, he's been going around to events by himself. Right? 
I mean, one occasion he borrowed my gazebo but to do an outdoor event, but most of his events are indoor. He's actually been invited by organizations to come and speak at their different premises and venues because he's been like, he's been really researching black history and being able to look at it in an intimate way and make it more, more consumable, how that sound, more palatable. And, and make it easier for people to engage with. You know, so I'm really happy yeah. for him. But I'm, I'm happy that he called me when he didn't know what to do. And I was able to set him on the, you know, and he's-, he's And, and that's well. interesting in itself because that's how people describe you, you know, and there are a number of self-published authors who have come to you in some shape or form. I'm thinking of publishers like Winston Duncan, Pauline Gilman, who has come your way, Maggie, who's another self-published yes, author who yes, I know has yes. visited you at your offices yes. as well yes. and talk about how you enable them. And, yes. you know, if I don't get a chance to say this now, thank you for enabling me and giving me ideas of where I could showcase my book as well. And oh, I have yes, to say yes. the Voice newspaper has been very supportive of me. They wrote an yeah. article about um, loving the brothers and they also gave me the opportunity that was via, is it Lester Holloway, to yes. write an article for the Voice newspaper yeah, as well. Right. Yeah, that's good. Mm. That's good. That's really good. Um, you probably weren't the one making the decisions, but there was a lot of criticism at the time when they asked Prince Charles to do a guest edit of the newspaper. Yeah, the Did you get to meet him? Yes, I met him at the, oh Lord, when we go to the Buckingham Palace, when we go to the, the Commonwealth Day thing. Yeah, I did. I did meet him at that event. And uh, yes, he is uh, the voice. We have to engage with everybody. We can't we can't live in a silo. Right. So while we interpret the news from a black perspective, we can't just be in a vacuum. We have to engage. But it always has to be known that we are for the black community. So whoever is just talking to or working with our we still have the the interests of the black community at heart, you know, so yeah, that's what we're really about. So he didn't actually come into the office and work from the office or no, the, were the, you not the, there that day? The editorial team worked with his office, but uh, right. he was regularly consulted as to how oh, should this look, you know, and so forth. But then we, our team had the final say, because when you have a guest editor, you don't hand over everything to them and go about your business. You're still there you know, manning the ship and, uh, you know, trying to get some kind of uh, insight. And that issue, that issue, the, the distribution was really fantastic because we, we actually printed way more than we'd normally do, but there was a lot of interest even from places where we believe that there was no initial interest in what we're doing. Yeah, that was that was a good uh, collaboration. And I like that word. I, I like the use of the word collaboration, um, especially as a strategy moving forward where people are pulling together resources, time, effort, you know, expertise and so on. So um, I really do like the use of that word as well. Yeah. So if you had the opportunity to collaborate with anybody, who would it be? <laughs> okay, all right. Oh, Lord, that's a hard one now. On which side? On my voice side? On my book side? On my which side? All right. You already spoke about collaborating with uh, Miss Lou, and you worked in collaboration with King Charles. If you had the opportunity yeah. to work with anybody else, who would it be? Oh, Lord. All right. So, all right. I'm very... You see what I do with authors. I'm very passionate about that, right? So most of what I do with authors is on weekends anyway. So I'm a bit of a weekend warrior. Most of the, during the week, it's voice and glean and stuff, but on weekends. So I had the opportunity, I mean, two years running, I was a bookseller at uh, the Jerk Cookout. Jerk Cookout held at the Horniman Museum, right? So Levi Roots was going to be a guest there, right? And uh, the organizer, Tony Fairweather, said to me that Levi is going to be a guest. Well, guess what? Levi have a book come out, you know. Have you spoken to him? I said, no. He said, well, this is your opportunity. 
This is your chance, right? You need to reach out to him and reach out to his team and see if you can get some books and do a book signing at the event. I would think that would, the, the, the patrons would love that, right? So, so said, so done. I went into action and I reached out to the publishers and they sent me like all kind of like promotional material and they sent me the books on sale or return. I mean, these people don't know me, you know, <laughs> they don't know me. Sent me the books on sale or return. And then I went to the event. What I found though was that the line, the line for Levi Roots to do the book signing, the line was long going way down the road. <laughs> and when some people actually got up to him, it wasn't to get a signed book, he was to take a picture. <laughs> so that happened one year and it happened the second year. I forget the exact years now, but it happened twice. Right? That was very good. Right? I still have pictures. So the reason I mention that now is that presently, I have, I wouldn't say I've discovered, but there's a very, there's a very, I don't know if I'd say very famous author, or there's an author who has done a very famous book. Let me put it like that. Yeah. And some of you might be familiar with uh, the book Caribbean Vegan. Caribbean Vegan, right. So initially, I thought the person who did Caribbean Vegan lived in New York and then was a foreigner and a whole of that. <laughs> So recently I was on the looking through my feed and everything, and I saw a post. And the post said, blah, 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 doing a book signing in New York. So I said, blah, 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 are you coming to the UK? The reply was, I live here. So right away I had a headache. <laughs> so, because that book, I've been selling like loads of that book, Caribbean Vegan. And uh, I said, I'd love to meet you. So it's like I'm going into over I'm going into author mode now because I think I don't know if authors are attracted to me or if I'm attracted to authors, but I love working with authors because in fact, uh, I mean you're in uh, you you know of my book where uh, it's like me looking at 20 years of selling books and saying like 20 years of selling books, it's not about me. Without authors, there are no books. So all them fans, publishers and printers and, you know, agents and whatever they call themselves, if somebody don't sit down and say, you know something, I'm going to write a book, a lot of them don't have no work, right? And uh, yeah, I'm really happy with uh, what authors allow me to help them to do, right? So long story short now, so this lady now, the author of Caribbean Vegan, uh, Tama. Yeah, you, is that the book you have? That's not the Caribbean vegan. No, book. no, not yet. I'm I'm flicking through my phone as I'm talking All to right. you. It is the, it so is the same not, person. No. She's yes. she's got a new book coming out called um, yeah, something to do with book. planting. Yeah, that's right, yeah, to do with planting. Her. So yeah. Um, yeah, I'm looking forward to interviewing her on the podcast right. in so this series. Not. So that's the that's the circle, then, come isn't on. it? We've come back come round. On. It's, it's alignment, alignment, right? Because on okay. the 12th of August, when I go to the event at the Horniman Museum, which is called Jerk Music and Things. Yeah, Music Jerk and Things, right? Music Jerk, get it right, Garfield. Music Jerk and Things. I'll have her on my stand doing a book signing, right? And she's also going to be on stage doing a quick demonstration of maybe some of the planted recipes. And this is going to be the first place in the UK she is going to do this sort of activity, you know. And no doubt, uh, once we do that event, everybody's going to want to do an event with her. But she's, she's, she's really looking forward to, you know, meeting a lot of the people who have been buying her books and also, you know, looking forward to, to some new people who are going to enjoy. So that's a collaboration I'm looking forward to. There's some there's something between me and authors because uh, on the eighth of July in in West Works out in White City it was the Hammersmith and Fulham Writers Festival the head honcho Rashid had asked me to help her put a little a little program a little brochure together and while putting the brochure now somebody had approached her and she said oh Lord I don't have anything for you to do but maybe you could write an article about you know like how people are are like trying to think like about how women live rather than asking them. So it's an opportunity for you to tell, you know, from the woman's side. So the person who actually wrote the article 
we put it in the magazine. On my way to the event, I had to pick her up with a box of books. All right. You still hear the real story now. <laughs> you still hear the real story. So I picked up this lady and we had a chat going to the venue. This is about 8 o'clock in the morning. We reached the venue. So I pick her up like about 7.30. And we're chatting all the way to the venue. But we're going there at 8 because the thing going to start at 10.30. So we set up. She helped me set up and everything. We fixed up everything. And the event start and we're there selling. And she's signing book like crazy and everything. And I'm saying, wow, who is this lady? I mean, Rashida introduced me to her. I'm going to read the article. But I still don't know who she is. And it's like her book is called Sex Bomb. Right. Then one person now said, I want to buy your book because I saw you on TV the other morning. I said, oh, no, this is like 3.30. I said, Sadia, were you on TV which morning on ITV? She said, yes. She said, but me pick, me pick you up from 7.30 and we had talk. And you don't mention nothing about that. I mean, she's such a humble person. It's 3.30 in the afternoon. I said, this lady was on ITV talking about her book. And it's like, I don't know. I don't, I don't know. I don't know. I mean, if any author is trying to like find their way, I mean, I must say thanks to like Winsome and all the book journey mentors and all the book midwives, they do a great role, which is to like from the conception of the baby to giving birth. But to be honest, that's their specialty. And I think my specialty is now from the birth now to the marketing bit. So how do you sell this bit? So you have this little baby, which is a book. You need it to grow up to be a teenager, adult, or whatever. But you need to get sales from the book. I mean, you're telling your story, which is going to help people. But you need to sell it. And it needs. it's going to go far around the world. It's going to go places that you might never, ever dream of going. That, that's what books do. So I'm really happy. I was telling, to my, I was telling my children the other day that, you know something? I still don't know what I'm going to be in life. <laughs> so they said, lie, you're lying. But I said, but hold on, I, I found something I've enjoyed doing, which is the books and, and especially working with the authors. Because for me now, working with the authors is more important than selling the books. If I work with the authors and get them in the right frame of mind and everything, the book thing will take care of itself. You know? And I've actually been like, you know, every now and then I get like a volunteer on my stand and I show them the ropes, how to sell, how to talk to people, how to pull this hello. I mean, it's not your event, but you're there. You say, hello, welcome to the event, blah, blah, blah. Would you like to have a look at what we're doing? You can't go to an event and put out your stuff and you're on your phone, whatever, whatever. That's that's a no-no. Whether you're an author or you're just an ordinary person at the event selling, you can't do that, right? The other thing I've been very passionate about, up to today I was talking to somebody, is uh, there is no lesser standard for self-published books than mainstream published books. There's no lesser standard. There's one big book industry and we're a part of it. So guess what? When we publish our books, and in fact, I'm going to I don't even know if I can do this, man. I was going to make a law that we stop say self-published books and just say book. You understand? But I get, I guess why, why you know, some people say self-published because they did it on their own. They're, you know, they did it on their own. We don't know help from nobody. And that's great. That's great. That's resilience. That's like individual effort and all that. That's, that's great. But you see, when it comes out on the road now, it doesn't need to draw attention for not looking like the standard stuff. And when I say standard stuff, right? Uh, I was drawing drawing a comparison. I do I do quite a bit with Kandasi Chimbiri. She's done like uh, Story of Afro Here, Story of the Wind Rush, and Story of the Black Airmen. And she's done some other books as well. But her first first book, first first book, I think I first met her at a Black History Month at Wembley Stadium like long, long, long time ago. This is a long time. This is maybe 2003, four, right? And I, and I met her when I brief chat and everything. But those times I was, I was doing a lot with authors them times. I was, you know, more going to run to events, right? So Kandase, she did a self-published book. And I'll tell you something. If she doesn't tell you that it's self-published, you can't know. It has the logo. It has the 
pricing. It has the barcode. It have everything like set out like expert. And she do it 20 years ago. You understand? So I'm trying to encourage, you know, the authors I know, the authors listening to this podcast. And we must big up Pamela for, you know, giving a lot of people this, this voice, right? Because in these days, we can't be everywhere every time. And we need things like this podcast, which is giving Black authors a voice beyond their book. I mean, the book will go places where they can't go, and their voice will go places to maybe where they can't go. But you, you're really playing a valuable role in this whole thing. And uh, yeah, more of us kind of need to like figure out uh, what's our role and play our role to the best of our, our ability. And that's how our community, our society is going to move forward. You know, we have to be working together, sometimes individually, but together, you know, and, and, and seek to do more of that. And I'm really, like I said, I'm really, really passionate about this, this price on the back. That's why I call it price on the back. Because right now I have some books in a shop in Birmingham. It's the Black Ponds Project in Birmingham. And when I was sending the first batch, this is, this is my second time there. And when I was sending the first batch, the gentleman said to me, okay, so when you send your products, right? Because I know he knows I'm going to send books. Any book that does not have the price on, it's a pound to add on the price. And I'm saying, wow. So I'm not going to send those that don't have price on the back. But then I'm looking at it even a wider sense now. Let's say I reach out to a couple of shops or, you know, whatever. They're going to flip them over and look at them. And I'm going to say, hey, what's this? We're not used to this. We used to seeing finished products, right? That's the standard that we have to, I wouldn't even say aspire to. We just need to do it, you know? We just need to do it. Because that, that's the standard. We shouldn't be less of a standard. We should be equal to or above the standard. That's that's where we should be aiming to be. Oh, absolutely. And and thank you so much for all that you've said, you know, especially the bit about giving feedback on books, because you gave yeah. me similar feedback as well. Yeah. That you know, yeah. obviously there is a barcode on it. There is an ISBN, yeah. but um, also having the price on the back yes. of the, of the yeah. book is equally yeah. as important. So yeah. going forward, when we um, have dealt with this batch, that is exactly what we yeah. are going to do. And as you said, you know, um, it's about meeting the the standard, but or exceeding it, yes. um, and that's in every way. It should look like every other book in terms right. of being proofread, properly edited, um, formatting the the whole thing, which I think leads us nicely on to your book. <laughs> Thank okay. you for sending me my copy. Um, I'm looking forward to receiving a copy of, I was absolutely chuffed to be in your book, which is called Keepers of the Flame, Saluting 100 Black Authors, Volume 1, yes, uh, compiled like by <laughs> Garfield Robinson, of course. And I use this book now as a directory so especially the first bit because obviously I'm always looking for authors okay. and the first thing I did was to tick off all of the authors that I have met so far on my wow. journey the little tick marks I don't really like writing in books but yeah. this got a little pencil mark in it next to the authors that I have met and okay. you know I'm so proud to be counted as one of the authors. I know exactly what page I'm on. I'm on page 100, which is all good as well, which is relevant. Um, and it's good to be counted. I think this is the first book of its kind um, where all the, um, you know, at least 100 um, black authors are yes. in one place. But yes. tell us why, why did you decide to do okay. it? Okay. All right. So let me tell you what happened now. So, yeah, I'm not going to take 15 hours, <laughs> 99 or 15 minutes, right? All right, I'm going to be telling you the truth and nothing but the whole truth, right? So last year now, I was, uh, you know, looking at my life, right? June, I was turning 60, right? So I was looking at my life and I said, whoa, what have I done? I like, there's things I've achieved. There's things I still want to achieve that haven't, haven't, haven't achieved, you know? Am I spending it the right way, you know? So all kind of questions, man, and, and searching, like, but uh, out of the searching, I said, there's one thing I've wanted to do for a while. And I've actually started a couple of times, but never finished. And that was writing a book. 
So I was saying, no, all right. So I've been selling books for 20 years. That's last October, 20 years. And I remember when it was 10 years, which would have been 2012, 20, 10 years. I tried to write a book about myself coming to England to seek my fortune and end up selling books. And there was a place I've learned around the UK, which I wouldn't never have gone to if it wasn't for books. I know I've been dragging my family to all kind of place. Some places I reached them before the organizer and all of that. And that looked bad. <laughs> so, so anyway, I said, all right. So it coming up to 20 years. I can't, can't write that, man. Can't write that. So I'm still thinking like, so what do I write? So I've decided on the book now, but what do I write? How do I do it? So I'm thinking all kind of stuff, what to, and different titles coming in my head and everything. And I remember something I overheard from a conversation. You know, in Jamaica, we said, deaf ears, Goliath, trouble. But I don't think it was lies. So I remember a bit of a conversation I heard. And the guy said, like, I think they were talking about somebody else, right? And the guy said, as the river runs, so is he. And I said, wow, that sounds deep. That sounds so profound that, like, I don't know. Even the very fact of saying it is profound, right? So I was saying, all right, I don't know what they were talking about, but that sounds like something I want to apply to myself. You know, my head, my head feel a little bit funny when I say that. So I applied to myself. And I'm saying, all right. So we know a river. River runs. It runs from where it starts, which is, I think, the river head. And it empties out in the sea, which I think is called the river mouth. But anyway, where it empties out is the end of the river, right? And if you're looking at, like me, out selling books, right, I would be at the end of a process because I'm a retailer, right? So in one sense, it worked. But then when somebody comes up to me and buys a book, the start of a journey for them, somebody says, wow, how do I square this now? So what's the end for me is the start for someone else, right? But is that really, there must be more to selling books than selling books. It can't just be it. This can't just be it. It must be something else. So I was questioning myself. I'm saying, all right, so talking about the end of the river, is, is this where I want to be? No, I don't want to be at it. I want to be at the start of the river, right? Who is at the start? It's the author. Because if the author don't think up things and ruminate and, you know, work them out and all of that, nothing else happens. So I want to be where the author is. But do I know how to do it? No, I don't know how to do it. <laughs> so I'm thinking for days now and I'm saying like, wow. I think I'm getting somewhere with the thought process, but a bit of it still still eludes me, you know? So, all right. So I'm there now there. And one evening I came home now from work, put on a TV and I'm watching, it's a game show. And I forget who exactly was the game show host, but I remember they were there chatting, chatting, chatting. And they said like, we asked a hundred people, what's your favorite color? I said, blam, that's me. That's me. I can ask a hundred black authors why you write, what inspires you, and when you write a book, what you want the reader to benefit. And I decided on that and I was resolute in my decision. But I'd be searching, I've been searching for days and weeks for this, this thing to come into my head. And I was saying, you know something? We decided on this idea now, you know, but maybe from the first week in a 2002, at 336 Brixton Road, and we start sell books. This book, maybe they start to write itself. We just never know until the right time is going to reveal itself to me. All right, so it's all right. So we decide on this now. How do we do this now? So, in fact, in 2012, when I was questioning whatever, I did put down, like, try to see how many authors I knew at the time. So I did it on Excel sheet and all of that. Yeah, I think I got to like, must be about 80 or something like that. But I left that to the side and, and, and moved on. So so last year now, on the 1st of March, so I'm dropping my work to go after school. And uh, I said, you know, I'm on a march of 31 days. She said, oh, good for you. Good for you. You sure you're okay? I said, yeah, man, I'm fine. Never felt better. I'm on a march of 31 days. So drop her to school and went to the office. And I'm still in that mood, upbeat mood, because... You know, I found, I found the solution to the problem now and I need to implement it now, right? So so went into the office and started some work. One of my colleagues came in. He was a designer. And I said, bro, I have a problem. I said, what? What am I here? You have a problem? I said, yeah, there's a book inside of me and it has to come out. He said, all right, I'll help you, man. 
We said, hold on, you know, tell me if you got charged me or not now. So, we said, nah, man. We start out the book, and it reminds me when Bob Marley said, if money if you come out, it, make money come out. Right? We said, we're going to sort out the book, and then after that, we, we talk, right? I've paid him, by the way. I've paid him. <laughs> so, all right. So then, uh, so what I started to do now, so in the day now, I'm doing voice stuff and cleaner you know, stuff. And then in the evening now, it's a lot of emails, not a lot of telephone calls, because I don't want to keep up the rest of family, you know, with me chatting all night. So it's a lot of emails, telephone call every now and then. So reach out to a couple of authors and they actually like, they say, whoa, never seen it like this yet. I have to be in it, right? So people start come forward and so forth. But I was so pumped that I felt I could do it all in March. No, it wasn't to be, right? So we did go hard. And then at the end of March, I had uh, 40 profiles. 40 authors has sent me their photo information and everything and i can tell you a bit about the process so it's like they sent me 200 words why you write what inspires you and you know how you want to read it to benefit and their name i mean some people have a name which is not the name that you know them by so we had to work on a couple of those and then i was saying but how can i make this special the name bit so while i'm thinking about it i'm saying whoa there's an app called what three words how can i pull in technology into what I'm going to do. So I said to each author, you know what you're going to do? You're going to give me three words that describe your character or kind of like three words that get people to reach where you are, which is kind of modeling on the location app, if you, you understand that. So that's what I did. So yeah, people start saying, whoa. One guy said, you know something, I can't choose the three words. Somebody has to choose them for me. So, we're, you know, all kind of things. So anyway, at the end of March, 40 profiles, and I said to my colleagues, gentlemen, this thing can work now. This can work. We just have a, you know, a little bit more resolute. So April now, March enough, 31 days done. <laughs> but to read somewhere. <laughs> so so April now, we add it again. Mostly evenings and nights. Add it again, add it again. So the end of April now, we have eight profiles. So I saw so Miss Lucy like my glad bag bus. Because 80 profiles means that it can really work. So 40 means that, yeah, it looks like it can work. 80 profile, we're 80% of the way. So going over into May now, it's like a lot of weekends and nights. And we finished we finished the middle of May, right? And the designer sent me the files. I think during the day, I had gone to a meeting up in Birmingham. And uh, in the evening now, I'd paid the print already because I knew I was going to be on the road. In the evening now, he sent me the file and I look at it. And I press OK to the printer while I was going to take the train. And I was saying, Ooh, have I done the right thing? <laughs> so, so I was a little bit nervous now after I pressed the thing. And for the next two weeks now, well, for the next 10 days, I'm saying, wow, what's it, what is it going to look like? <laughs> so, this is this is the first ever I'm, I'm yeah, like responsible for publishing a book. <laughs> If it looked like rubbish, people gotta cuss me and like what I hope it I hope it works. Right. On the first of June, while I was at work, some boxes were delivered to my house. And uh yeah, my dear wife received them. <laughs> and she sent me a little WhatsApp. Oh, some boxes came for you. And I at work I was mad. I was beside myself. I said, Wow, you know, from the March of 31 days, I haven't said nothing else to her about marching or climbing or walking <laughs> so <laughs> so i mean i actually can't wait to get to omana so i was i was beside myself the whole day if my boss is watching yes i did watch the clock that day because <laughs> so, <laughs> yes so so when i got to him now thank you very much for receiving the boxes cut one open i said this is yours so what's this i said look at the cover she said oh you've done it you've done it i said no you were talking about like publishing a book and but I never know that it kind of got so far you know congratulations then she said get a little hug in the middle of the hug she jumps back and I'm saying oh like <laughs> so she said hold on hold on hold on a little bit who knew about this who knew who knew so I'm saying wow this like sound like dangerous now <laughs> so <laughs> so I said okay so when we when I was doing it uh, you know I showed the children some of the pages and they said yeah that look good that is that look good man do it make sure you do it so I said, yes. So, oh, so she said, oh, so the children knew. Hmm, the children knew. <laughs> so, so 
She said, who else knew? So I said, oh, no. I thought we had finished. <laughs> so, so I said, uh, no, your sister in Jamaica, I, I sent her some pages to look at her. And she said, whoa, this look good, man. This this is good. Make sure you finish it. You know? <laughs> so, so that kind of encouragement. So, so she said, oh, interesting, interesting. Who else knew? So I'm saying, whoa, this stage I'm starting to get nervous now. So I'm saying, whoa, look like I'm going to have a night on the tiles or not on the tiles, tiles, but outside with the dogs. So I'm going <laughs> to sleep. <on> a... <laughs> so I'm thinking, you know, I'm going to say to Bruno, Bruno, move up a little bit more, come beside you. But the thing is that we do have a dog. So, <laughs> so I said to her, so, okay, so I sent some pages to my brother in America and he looked at them and he said, oh, that's good, that's good. So I get encouragement from the family right wrong. So she said, oh, so it's not going to be one, never know. But I didn't, I was so like out of my head that I didn't, I didn't say that when I said in the car, I'm on a march of 31 days, that's what I was trying to tell you, but I just left it there, right? So I said to her, okay, okay, I'm sorry, but I can explain because I'm thinking quick now, no. But like I said, I don't have no Bruno for God, you know, stay beside her or nothing. So I so, said, okay. So we've been married now for 33 years, right? And I've told you a lot of things that I've done. But I've also told you things I've never done. I've never gotten to do them and, and never finished them. And I didn't want this book to be another thing that I tell you that I'm going to do and I never finish it. She said, okay, when you explain it like that, you're forgiven. Apology accepted. Congratulations. And I said, Whoosh. That was a close one. <laughs> so, yes, yes. That, and um, as I said, it's absolutely beautiful, um, unique. I, I love all of the photos, the drawings that are on yeah. one side and then what people had to write about on the other side as well. Yeah, but yeah. you know that there were a few people who were upset that they were not in, in the first cohort of oh. um, authors. <laughs> Um, I mean, right. if it's a 100, you can't you can't make it a 101. You have to stick at 100. Right. So what are you doing to redress the, the balance? Okay. <laughs> okay, so I must say, right, thank you to everybody who, well, full participated. The Rastaman said they're not participate. They, they came fully, right? So, you know, thanks to everybody who, who came on board. And because this, this was really my way of trying to find a way to pay my respects to the authors who, if there are no authors, there are no books. So as a bookseller, you are wanting to protect where your goods come from, right? You're wanting to, to recognize their efforts. You're wanting to salute them. That's why I said saluting 100 Black authors, because... You know, so while I was doing this thing, man, I got a phone call one day and the lady was, she was crying on the phone. And I was saying, I forget this who now. She, I was saying, so lady, we are crying for. She said, look here, you send me this invitation about this book thing, right? I've been writing books from, I'm a, I'm a young person and thing. And, you know, I've never been recognized anywhere from aware. And you now come recognize me. So I'm, I'm, I'm very emotional. I have to cry. <laughs> so we say, so I said, all right, but guess what now? At some point, I've got to stop this crying. If you don't stop, I'm going to start crying. Because when I started this thing, I didn't set out to make anybody cry. <laughs> so, you know, so those are some of the things that, uh, you know, have been happening, you know, with me trying to ensure that our authors, because the author thing is, how do I do this now? Every day, many persons, many people, a lot of us think of a lot of things, right? So let's say you have a group of 200 persons and they talk about, I don't know, aliens in outer space, right? Out of the 200, maybe two go join a club, maybe 15 not talk about aliens anymore and, and maybe 10 go on to something else. And then maybe five persons say, oh, you know something? I've been really fascinated by this alien thing. I'm going to do some research and, you know, See if maybe I'm an alien or, or not or whatever. And then from that now, five of them start research. And after a while, maybe three of them give up on a bother. Two of them continue and say, you know something? I want other people to know my experiences, my journey, the time when the alien did kidnap me in the desert and then it find me three days afterward and it was all right. I want to tell my story. So out of the 200, we thought of the alien thing and would, but one person actually finished them book, 
right? So this one person, in a way, them kind of rep representing the other 199 will never finish. And then they're also representing the public who are interested maybe in that topic and would like to find something they can dig into. Maybe it's a beach read, maybe it's a science fiction novel, maybe it's a something, something that they can engage with that would maybe fulfill their curiosity or realize that I'm not the only person who thinks like this. See, this guy's done a book and I bought his book or this woman has done a book and it, it reads well. It's been well researched and, you know, you know, it's their experience. And if he writes another one, I'd buy that as well. So it's like authors have a very, very important role, right? And if you notice, I am purposely not saying published authors. I'm talking about authors, right? Because in my volume two, there's going to be a page defining who an author is. Because for volume one, I actually had to convince some people that they were authors. You'd never believe this. Yes. Oh, wow. I didn't know that. How they look at their work, how they look at their work and how they define themselves. If you draw for the dictionary definition and impose it on them, they say, whoa, I didn't know I was an author. I just see myself as a like, writer and a whatever. Yeah. And author, the word author, I'll, I'll forget the definition now, but it has something to do with thoughts. Right. In the book, I'm going to define like the where the word come from and what it means and and so forth. And I'm hoping that more people who don't realize that they're authors will say, whoa, if I didn't know I'm an author, I need to do something about it. Right. So volume two is going to have a page dedicated to giving one or two definitions of who an author is and maybe a little bit about their role in society you know so so garfield tell me when is volume two coming oh, out <laughs> i was i was afraid of that question i was afraid of that question so all right i'm gonna be 300 percent honest now so volume two should have come out at the beginning of june to kind of match volume one like a year later right the whole truth about it is that uh, this year being the 75th anniversary of Windrush, my responsibilities at work, different events and all about, I had to put it to the side. We got over that. And then uh, I must say that my designer lost his mom. So you had to, we had to give him time to grieve, right? He's just coming back around now. So with those big events guys it's a big event to lose your mama even if she she was ill she brought you into the world you know so yeah we had to grieve with him you know because we've been working with this guy for years long long time man i know this guy from we worked in elephant and castle which is yeah way about that time so I've, I've known him easily 18 19 17 years maybe yeah so so he's just coming back around now so we're just making plans to go back again so we have the 100 authors in volume two. We just need to do a little bit of tidying up. We have had one proofreading already. Then my second proofreader now is my backup proofreader now. She's, uh, she actually has a family emergency, so she's, she's not even in the country. She is working, but I have to give her some time to deal with you know, family stuff. So when she returns, yeah, we'll hand over to her and she'll do the second proofreading. And uh, with her keen eye, she'll see other things that Maybe I didn't see or my first proofreader I didn't see. So it's uh yeah, these are these are, you know, my 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 friends who are like my family now. So so I have to pay respects to them, you know. So I mean condolences obviously to um your friend, but we can expect the book at some point this year. What does volume three look like? Oh <laughs> my my grandma says you're taking tears out of church now. <laughs> <laughs> what I tried to do in volume one, believe it or not, what I tried to do is to invite a hundred authors who are actually new, right? Because when I look at 20 years, I have met a couple hundred authors 
And if if I look at like books I've sold, it's from a couple hundred authors who some of them have, I've never met them. When the book just came out, I was happy to say that the hundred, I knew all of them and they all lived in the UK. But since that, it's a year later now. I know one lady lives in Jamaica now. She went to Jamaica with her family to live. And somebody, I think, lives in Ghana now, one of the other authors. I forget which one right now. But I know it's 98 of them still live in the UK. So in volume volume two, I think there's two Jamaicans. Yeah, they live in Jamaica. That's that's what I mean by Jamaicans, because yeah, you don't live in the UK, right? Two authors who live in Jamaica. And yeah, most of the rest of them, most of the rest of them are UK, UK based. Some of them though is I didn't meet them over the 20 years. I've met them since book one came out. So you see the things that change up now. So by we enter volume three now. There's going to be still a lot I know because the average event I go to, I mean, I was say, I was at an event and I was saying, whoa, the average event I go to, I meet one or two authors who I've never met before. And I was kind of quiet because I never seen no authors. By the time I said that, I don't know where them come from. Two authors turn up. I said, oh, my God. Oh, how funny. People now have been sending people to me, right? So I remember I went to an event in Southall. So I went to I know this lady a long time, right? She's part of the University of West London. And uh, yeah, they were giving me some help for my business as well. And kind of, uh, what do you call them? Incubator. So I've been trying to get not just book selling, but a proper business business, right? So I went to this event now and this young man came over to me and he said, him say, hello, Garfield. Carlin sent me to you. He said, well, Carlin sent it to me for. I first may I meet this man. <laughs> First, me, I meet this man and he come over like him know me. Hello, Garfield. Carlin sent me to you. I said, wow, what is now? I said, what Carlin sent it to me for? I said, oh. I said, all right. So I've been writing. So I'm, uh, I forget the word he used. Like he's a uh, like prospective author. Something like that, he said. Some fancy term, right? So he said, I've been writing now, but he's stuck. He's stuck and him, him don't know where to go next. So I said, oh, I have the answer for you. Here is a book with a hundred inspirational stories of authors who I believe will kind of get you back on the track. So he take it up on him, start, look at him, say, what? He said, I've never seen something like this before. Never. He said, all right, please sign it for me. So sign it for him and thing, and he paid me and everything. And he went off. This was about like 10, 30, 11, 30 in the morning. You know, about three o'clock, I see the man coming back. I'm saying, whoa, where do I run? What? <laughs> this man is coming. This man is coming towards me and he's like, him very purposeful and him resolute and him coming straight to me and I'm looking around and I'm not going to nobody else. He's coming straight to me and I say, wow, what is now? <laughs> so, so I'm like, Garfield, how you doing? He said, I'm saying nothing to be scared about, man. He said, oh, because word, I, was, I think he was coming to fling back the book at me or something. He said, no, nah, man, you're joking. He said, look here, I'm on my way to visit a dear friend and uh, I want to bring a gift for them, right? And I don't want to go to the shop by them, right? I would like a second book for my friend. So did and he told me the name and what and you know what is the person like and I wrote it in it. Sometimes I'm writing those things and I'm I'm saying, whoa, it's me writing them things. So it's like, and I said this thing to someone a couple of years ago, right? So I came to England following well, my grandfather was here, my dad was here. So I kind of feel, I don't know if it's destiny or whatever, but but I didn't know what I was coming here to do because I've, I've not done what they were doing, right? So my grandfather worked in, I was told he worked in a pin factory. So I'm wondering how much joke him get by pin and all kind of things. That's a long time ago. And my dad, no, I know my dad was always a carpenter, right? But he never liked the place because I'm still like, I'm still like feel ice. They just put a pan of water out of the night time and then get ice. I mean, I not really like that. So he went off to America. And uh, yeah, that's where he he worked and and sent back money to build our home, you know. We were living next door, grandma. So yeah, he launched it and did that. Back to the point I was trying to make. Yes. So I was saying to the person like, when I came here, I didn't come here for selling no books. I mean, I've always loved selling and everything because uh, I grew up helping my grandmother in a grocery shop. She would say to me, "You can't buy nine, I sell nine. So we now say, you know, in business, 
you must have a profit motive. So if you buy something for £5, you can't sell back for £5. You're looking to sell it for £15. There's cost of sales, there's expenses, there's lunch, there's rent, there's all kind of things. So you can't buy nine or sell nine, you know. So I was saying to the person, you know something? I wasn't coming to England to sell no books. But I think when I came here, books chose me to sell them. And I think that's what it really is, you know. The books chose me to sell them. And then by that now, I have to take care of the people who make the books, which is the authors. So that's that's how I kind of see my role, you know. Well, Garfield, I could talk to you for another okay. for another hour quite easily. But I am going to end the interview here by saying um, congratulations on Thank 20 years in the business and wishing you 20 more years um, <laughs> of book selling as well because it's obvious that it's uh, that you love it you love the engagement with authors and readers alike as well and wishing you all the best with volume two three and four that's coming up you know i'm looking yeah, forward yeah. to that um i love how the, the more you promote it the more authors that you are coming into contact with and may the blessings return to you 100 fold for the work that you're doing also yeah, so thank you, thank you and bye for now thank you yeah thanks It is competition time now. I am mentioned in Garfield's book. What page am I listed on? Was it A, page 99, B, page 100, or C, page 101? Contact me on Instagram at lovingtheauthor with the correct answer by this Friday for your chance to win a copy of his book, Keepers of the Flame saluting 100 Black Wolfers. Good luck. Thanks for listening and we'll see you next time. Bye for now.